The subject of this tape is a mystery that surrounds the Ark of the Covenant. It was given by Chuck Messler in May of 1992. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we, we just thank you for the opportunity you have provided for all of us to get together in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that there are no accidents in your kingdom, that we're all here right now by your divine appointment. So, Father, we just pray that you'd open our hearts and lives to the ministry of your word. And we pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would just move among us and teach us those things that you would have us learn. Help us to be more responsive to your word and your will in our lives. That we might grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Last time we talked, of course, about Magog. But, and we talked about the chief, the lead ally of Ezekiel 38, Aram. But you might be, just as a little insert, sort of an update before we get into tonight's study, it's interesting to, to start looking into what's, what has been going on in the country of Iraq. Um, about two weeks into the Persian War, one of our uh, pilots after he hit his primary target, had a couple of missiles and adequate fuel left over, so he decided just to hit a secondary target, something that wasn't considered that important, but he had an opportunity, so he went ahead and launched two Hellfire missiles into one of the larger buildings in, at al Tamiya and went home to base. Just almost incidental. Aerial reconnaissance showed it the next several days with uh, Iraqis crawling all over the place, and they knew there's something up, so they had the (laughs) B-52s, you know, (laughs) remove it from existence. And uh, it turns out it was a major industrial site for for the production of enriched uranium. And um, what was startling, as we discovered later, it used one of the most inefficient methods of uranium enrichment. There are five methods gas centrifuges, which are very efficient, laser enrichment, very. Uh, both of those are very expensive. The, um, the, um, uh, the gas diffusion and the laser being expensive, excuse me. And, uh, but the uh, electromagnetic isotope separation is the technique that we used during uh, World War II, the Manhattan Project. And... Uh, if you know anything about that as a professional, you know it's so inefficient and so expensive and so forth, no one dreamed that anyone would ever use it again. So what's interesting is that all the cl- documents from the Manhattan Project of World War II have been declassified. So if you want to build a nuclear bomb in your garage, all you have to do is go and get the public documents and put them together. And uh, I will mention that the re- bibliographical references will be available in the newsletter for those of you that want to undertake the development of a small weapon in your garage. Um, it takes enormous electrical power, and they had a power plant far enough away with underground, underground cables. Um, to give you some feeling, in, in the Manhattan Project, they used more um, electricity than all of Canada, as an aside. Uh, it takes a lot of electricity. They also use the entire uh, U.S. Stock, silver stockpile just for the magnets. Anyway, by using uh, mapping techniques, they found a duplicate complex at ash Shakat, And uh, uh, fortunately, one of the engineers defected from there and gave us a lot of insight. But the key interesting thing for you to put things in perspective, it appears that Iraq has spent over $10 billion dollars on uh, their nuclear program and has employed over 12,000 people. You and I probably have a tendency to look at some of these Middle Eastern countries as backward. That's naive. Iraq has an incredibly sophisticated technology infrastructure. And they carried on, uh, they were only about 12 months away, 12 to 18 months away from a major nuclear capability when we hit. As you look at the Persian Gulf and you hear people talk about it, remember, see the whole thing started back in the 60s when they purchased a two-megawatt Soviet light water uh, research reactor. And then the French sold the Tamas I and the Tamas II to Iraq in the mid-'70s. When the Israelis found out about it, they hit it in '81. The famous Israeli raid of 1981 wiped, set them back. 
And, uh, of course, the Israelis were lambasted in our press at the time. But I want you to realize, had they not done that, our troops would have been facing nuclear weapons last spring. And I think, so that's the Israelis. Uh, we owe them that. I won't get into the rest of the technology. It'll all be in our newsletter. But I thought you might be kind of interested in the whole. The main idea is that... Um, uh, the device that separates uranium in the, uh, U, U, the U-235 from the U-238 in the EMIS, the electromagnetic isotope separation method, the device is called a calutron. And uh, documentation has been discovered in Iraq that they had about 90 of them um, to be installed just at uh, Tarmia. Eight of them had been installed Seven of them were in various stages of assembly. The rest have not been found. They've been successfully hidden. And uh, our inspection teams have not been able to uncover that. They have discovered um, also gas centrifuges, and uh, they had raw materials ordered for over 10,000 of them. Now, you wouldn't order that unless you had some pilot plants running so you knew what you needed. They have not been able to find the pilot plants. And there's also evidences that they had uh, plutonium programs beginning. So all of this is still underground, still hidden in Iraq. Our inspection efforts have uh, have uh, failed to uh, uh, highlight just where the rest of it is. So Saddam Hussein is not out of the ball game either. He and Rafsanjani are having the big race. Rafsanjani of Iran has uh, united with Syria and um, to try to organize a uh, Islamic crescent from Indonesia to Mauritania, and uh, the race is on. And of course, as you, as you, as we talked about last time, and I think it's now gotten in the press that uh, Iran has three nuclear weapons. They were all operational at the end of April, and uh, so it's all getting very exciting. And I think we mentioned to you last time that nuclear weapons have a limited shelf life. And uh, the best evidence we have from the plutonium processing from Chernobyl and rest is that the Soviet shelf life appears to be about seven years which you can learn from looking at the various military publications or read Ezekiel 38 or 39. It'll tell you the same thing. So uh, kind of exciting times, gang. Kind of exciting times. Well, I think we've done enough for a while of nuclear weapons and stuff. I thought we'd shift gears tonight a little bit. We have in the past talked about the rebuilding of the temple and what's going on in Israel. Um, And also, I think we've talked on several occasions about the background of the temple, namely the tabernacle. And we've been through that, and uh, we'll have occasion in the future to go through it again if that is is news to you. But of course, what's interesting in all of these discussions is uh, the Ark of the Covenant. And it's interesting because in Israel it's a non-issue hard to get people too excited about it. But in the United States, it is the hot button, even in the secular world. And it's my uh, suspicion that that's partly due to Harrison Ford. Hmm? In 1981, there was a very successful movie that was really a spoof of the old B trailers called, uh, you know, uh, The Raiders of the Lost Ark and all of that. And some of you may or may not be sensitive that the Indiana Jones was a subtle inside joke poking fun at Wendell Jones, uh, who has uh, uh, been chasing the ark and the ashes of the red heifer and all this around the land, uh, landscape. And so uh, Indiana Jones was just a, uh, an inside uh, gag, if you will. I don't think Wendell Jones runs around with a leather hat and a whip, by the way. That's a, <laughs> but uh, the only guy I, knew, uh, I know that does that is Don Stewart, my co-author. But... Uh, the, um, but the movie, although it was just or- oriented for entertainment, did raise some questions. Like, where is the ark? I love the way the movie ended. It had a very clever ending. <laughs> that it's lost in the government warehouse. That was kind of... <laughs> <laughs> but the real question that seems to lurk in every corner, anyone that has any awareness of the Ark of the Covenant, is where is the ark? So I thought what we'd do tonight is just chat a little bit about the Ark of the Covenant. And... Um, We've talked about the tabernacle, this uh, interesting structure that God gave Moses on the Mount Sinai that that led him through the wilderness for 40 years or more, yeah, 40 years or more, and then they also, um, and then through the promised land for quite a while, and all uh, serving a purpose all the way up until 
uh, its codification, in a sense, in Solomon's temple. And, of course, the prime feature of the seven pieces of furniture in the tabernacle, the climactic one, the key one, was, of course, this interesting box-like structure called the Ark of the Covenant. The word ark actually means, in the Hebrew, a box or a chest. It's so used in 2 Kings 12, twice. Its size was, of course, uh, two and a half cubits long, one and a half cubits high, one and a half cubits wide. And that means it is approximately 40 to 50 inches long, depending whether you're using an 18 or 20 inch cubit, just to give you a feeling for that. It was about 27 or 30 to 30 inches wide or high, both. And um, just to give you a, a mental visualization of it. 34 times it's called the Ark of God. Sometimes it's called the Ark of Your Strength. It's also called the Ark of the Testimony, and so on. It's got several different names throughout the Scripture, but unmistakably we know what we're talking about. It's what the, the, the most common term is the Ark of the Covenant. And um, now, it thus speaks of the covenant of Exodus 24 and elsewhere. It's a covenant of blood. The ark, uh, its principal role was to be sprinkled with blood on Yom Kippur. The ark, the Holy of Holies, was only entered once a year, and only by the high priest, and then only after great ceremonial ritual cleansings and so forth, bringing to it the blood for his sins and the sins of his people. The ark of the covenant. And uh, that is, um, in fact, uh, Let's just turn to Hebrews 9 to get a New Testament perspective. Hebrews 8 and 9 are essential reading when you're talking about the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, because you need to recognize that even the original Ark built by Moses, actually built by uh, Bezalel and Athaliab for Moses, they were the craftsmen, And that's all recorded in Exodus 31. But the point is that ark was a copy, a replica of one that God showed Moses that sits in heaven. That's clear from the Torah. It's also clear from Hebrews 8 and 9. And it's also clear from Revelation 11, the last verse. Revelation 11 is an interesting chapter. It opens with two verses about the coming temple. We've talked about that. It closes with a vision of the Ark of the Covenant, but it's in heaven, not on the earth. And realize that's the original Ark, not the original in the sense the one Moses made, but rather the one that God instructed Moses to copy. And uh, Okay, uh, Hebrews 9, verse 16. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testor, uh, testor, testator. For the testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon, neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and and of goats with water and scarlet wool and the hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. I've often thought that when we talk about offerings, the, 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 the uh, tabernacle, that it would be an interesting experiment to start the Bible study by bringing in a small animal. A little goat, maybe. Cute little guy, you know. Let all the girls pet them, you know. And sort of enjoy the little creature. And then we start the Bible study. I bring it up here and I'll slit its throat. And offend everyone in the audience. Girls will go pale. Three or four of them will run out the back door to the nearest SPCA and say, Chuck Mister's gone off his rocker. You'd all be shocked, wouldn't you? Exactly, you should be. God intends you to be. We glibly read about the offerings of the Old Testament without witnessing the reality. And they didn't start with Moses, by the way. It's interesting, how many of each kind of animal did Noah 
take into the ark, the ark, his ark. Two of each kind, but seven, seven of the unclean, excuse me, seven of the clean, two of each of the unclean, right? The next time you talk to somebody about that, ask them, how did Noah know what was clean and unclean? Those are ritual definitions. There's nothing intrinsically clean or unclean about it. Those are ritual definitions. And the point is, those ideas did not start with Moses and Aaron and Leviticus and the Mount Sinai. Those ideas started in Eden when God taught Adam and Eve taking away their fig leaves and giving them coats of skins, taught them that by the shedding of innocent blood they would be covered. And that concept is one that God um, hammers away throughout the Scripture and, of course, gets codified in the Levitical laws, but it didn't originate there. And that's a shock to us. It's strange for us to witness all this ritual slaying. And yet that pales into comparison in comparison with the blood that was shed on a Roman cross almost 2,000 years ago. All those ritual slayings pointed to the ultimate sacrifice, the shedding of Jesus Christ's blood on your your behalf and mine. The rest were just, in effect, like object object lessons. In any case, we have the center of all this, the place that the blood was sprinkled, was the Ark of the Covenant. Now, uh, as we study the ark, as I mentioned, it's built by two craftsmen under Moses' direction, Exodus 31, according to a heavenly pattern. While we're in Hebrews here, you might pop back to Hebrews chapter 8, pick up verse 5, again for a little perspective. Hebrews 8, 5, speaking of the priests, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern shown to thee in the mount. So all these things are copies, if you will, of something more primary. Well, we speak of the Ark of the Covenant, 40 to 50 inches long, you know, 27 to 30 inches high and wide, a box made of acacia wood, but then wrapped in gold, inside and out. The lid of the box, as we might call it, and of course it was fitted with rings with two poles, and I'll come back to that. The lid of the ark was solid gold, and it has a very peculiar name. In the English translation, King James is called the mercy seat. Reasonably descriptive, the mercy seat. It's made of pure gold, Exodus 25, 17. It had emblazoned upon it two large cherubim. And these were after the likeness of a man, but with wings, more than two, apparently six. But they also had four faces. And I'm very anxious to actually see the ark, because I find it hard to visualize how that might be rendered. But in any case, uh, they're uh, well described. We've talked a lot about the, the cherubim. In fact, God is spoken of as the one that dwells between the cherubim implying two. He actually dwells up between four, we see. Every time we see the throne of God, Ezekiel 1 and 10, Isaiah 6, Revelation 4, we always see God surrounded by four cherubim. But on the Ark of the Covenant, it's, it's rendered in the, in, the, in the form of a pair of these. And when the Ark was put in the Holy of Holies, the Shekinah, the Shekinah as we sometimes call it, the Shekinah glory, entered the tabernacle. This cloud of a fire by night, smoke by day, actually dwelt over the tabernacle and then in the Holy of Holies. And it was God's presence. Strange stuff, but very vividly described in the, in the, in the scripture. When Solomon later builds his temple and dedicates it, there also the Ark of the Covenant was in the Holy of Holies and indeed the Shekinah enters. In fact, it's described twice. In, uh, and uh, the, the priests couldn't get in there. They were crowded out for a while. I think that's kind of interesting. It made an impression. Now, the Ark of the Covenant has this lid. It's called the mercy seat because the concept that is sort of modeled here is that God dwells above between the cherubim. And as he looks down into the Ark, he would see the broken law. But in Yom Kippur, because of the sprinkled blood, the blood of the sacrifice... 
that allows him to invoke his mercy. That's why it's called the mercy seat. That's a wonderful name for the throne of God. Our God is a God of mercy. We must never confuse the God of the Old Testament with the one that the Islamics call Allah. There are many that would try to persuade you, well, that's just another name for God. Not quite. Muhammad, uh, Islam did not start with Muhammad. Islam started at Babylon. al Ilya, which later became Allah, was the name of the moon god. The moon god in Assyrian was known as Sin. The word meant moon god. Sennacherib means sin multiplies its brothers. The symbol of the moon god in Babylon and in Assyria was the crescent moon, which you notice adorns all the mosques. There are more Islamics in France than all the Protestant denominations put together. There are more Muslims in Britain than Christians. 900 churches have been converted to mosques. The number of Muslims in the United States number three times the total membership of the Assembly of God, and so on. You can get into some very interesting statistics. Islam is the fastest-growing religion on the planet Earth. And we'll be be making some special studies of Islam uh, coming up. But don't confuse, in any case, Allah, which is a ruthless, relentless, severe representation of God. The good news is the God you and I worship is a God of mercy. And he's gone to incredible lengths to provide that mercy without violating his righteousness. A very expensive program. Getting back to the Ark of the Covenant, it's con- it contained. If you, could, if you could look inside, you would find the two tables of stone. The second set, because the first set, Charlton Heston ruined, you know. <laughs> But in Deuteronomy 10, the first couple of verses deal with the second set. God told him, you, you Moses, cut them out of stone. I'll, I'll write my laws. And he did. And they're, they're the ones that were in the ark. Aaron's rod. Remember the 12 tribes were rebelling. Or certain groups that were rebelling against the leadership of Aaron. So God had him put a, a row of staves in front of the tabernacle. And the next morning, one of them had blossomed, right? And God said, this bud's for you, right? Isn't that terrible? I can't miss, I can't pass those by. Someday, some, one of these days I'll outgrow that silliness. Also in the uh, ark was a two-quart container of manna to commemorate the provision during the wilderness wanderings. That's described in Exodus 16 and also in Hebrews 9.5. Later on, Deuteronomy 31 indicates that the complete book of the law was also in the ark. But somehow when we get to the day of Solomon, apparently, from 1 Kings 8, the only thing left in the ark were the two tables of stone. So somehow these other things get lost in history. The manna and Aaron's rod and so on. Now, let's talk about the placement of the ark. The ark had two staves or poles in it. If you visualize it being carried almost like a pallbearer on the shoulders of the Levites, a box with these two poles, you and I tend to visualize that as the poles going the longitudinal, the long way. That makes sense. You'll discover if you get into Israel and you start talking to the rabbinical traditions, they believe the poles went the other way, across the short ends. And the reason they believe that is because with the ark sitting in the Holy of Holies, there are apparently some rabbinical writings that indicate that the poles were poking at the veil so that from the outside they could tell the ark was there. And they also believe the poles are not removable. And I happen to have a problem with that because I have found references that the poles were removable. So the whole rabbinical tradition may be may be frail. Who knows? That's one of the things you find when you go to Israel and you start studying these things. You you quickly discover that they venerate very highly all kinds of rabbinical sources. And that's fine. And yet... um, uh, it's not, you know, they are not, in our view, not, not inspired writing. So uh, you suddenly find yourself plunged in all of this stuff. I mentioned the Shekinah, which is described in Leviticus 16.2, but it's also in Second Chronicles 5 and 7. Both mentions the Shekinah entering Psalm 7. Now, transporting the ark is kind of important. 
Um, because God provides a very specific way to, to be transported, not only on the shoulders of the Levites, but specifically the family of the Kohathites. Numbers 3 makes that clear. There are three families in the tribe of Levi, the Maronites, the Gershonites, and the Kohathites. And one of them had the external covering, some of the internal structures, but Kohathites, among other things, had the responsibility of the ark. And what they did when they uh, were ready to move it, they took the inner veil between the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place down in such a way that it wrapped the ark. They never were allowed to look at it or touch it directly. And after the inner veil wrapped it, they then wrapped it with a blue cloth. This is all in Numbers 4, if you want to chase it down sometime. But under pain of death, the Kohathites were not to touch the ark. And later on, I think you all know the story, when David goes to move the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. He does it on a cart. And the cart hits a rock, and a well-meaning guy by the name of Uzzah goes to, reaches up to steady it, to keep it from falling over, and gets struck dead. And that rattles David. And it causes him to realize that God takes his Ark very seriously. It seems so unjust that here this guy was trying to help, and yet God strikes him dead to make a point. And uh, David gets the point, and he offers sacrifice, and he's more cautious from that point on in terms of his dealing with it. Enthusiasm and sincerity can be zeal without knowledge, and those ideas are still prevalent today. It's interesting, God's presence in the, uh, over the ark is described in Exodus 25, Numbers 7, Leviticus 1. In Numbers 27, it indicates that God spoke audibly from the ark on certain occasions. And we find these kinds of things with Hezekiah in 2 Kings 19, certainly David in 1 Chronicles 13, Solomon, 2 Chronicles 5, and so on. The Ark of the Covenant, in addition to its actual power, and we'll talk about that in a minute, one of the things that you find throughout history is it starts getting surrounded by legends of magic and mystery. And that's understandable when you discover what the Ark really did accomplish. When Moses passes the baton to Joshua, one of the first acts that Joshua does is to enter the promised land. He crosses the Jordan. And when the priests carrying the ark touch the Jordan, it rolls back upriver, all the way back to the city. There's a city called Adam, all the way back to the city of Adam. That's all in Joshua 3. The, one of the most interesting studies in the scripture is to study carefully the book of Joshua and specifically the battle of Jericho. Because the more you know about the Torah, the first five books of Moses, the more puzzled you'll become when you study the book, the, the Battle of Jericho. Because if you've done your homework, you know that the Levites were exempt from military duties, and secondly, the Ark was not to go to war. And yet, at Jericho, who leads the procession? The Levites, and bearing the Ark. You also know that six days you engage in whatever you're doing, and the seventh you rest. Not a Jericho. Six days, once a day, and then the seventh day, seven times. And as you study the book of uh, Joshua, you'll discover it's a miniature of the book of Revelation. Yehoshua, the leader, sends in two witnesses first. And then there's this whole conquest with the seven trumpets, etc. So there's a whole pattern that you can study. The, the, his enemies rally around a leader by the name of Adonai Zedek, the Lord of Righteousness who gets his clock set in the Battle of Beth Horon with signs in the sun and the moon and so forth. Kings that are defeated hide in caves. It sounds like Revelation 6. As you go through the book of Revelation, you'll notice that, and the more you know the book of Joshua, the more you know the book of Revelation, you'll discover amazing parallels in language and structure and so forth. One of my favorite episodes involving the Ark of the Covenant is when the Philistines captured it. And uh, I can't resist going to that in uh, detail. Let, well, before we get there, the ark, of course, travels with the tabernacle for 40 years through the wilderness. Then Joshua takes over. They cross the Jordan. The ark is obviously with them as they conquer the land. Once they conquer the land, the ark is and the tabernacle is situated at Shiloh for about 400 years. It's, it's about 20 miles north of Jerusalem. You'll find this in Judges 18, 21, 1 Samuel 1, and so on. For a short while, when they had a war with Gibeah, it moved to Bethel, 
But as soon as that was over, they move it back to Shiloh. But it might be kind of fun to, uh, to take a look at this. Let's turn to 1 Samuel. I, sort of, I, this is, I think my candidate for what's got to be the funniest episode in the Bible. It's very, very hard to present all of this with a straight face. My kind of passage. <laughs> Let's just start in First uh, Samuel chapter four, and we'll and uh, well, the first few verses just to pick up some. Well, let's go. Jump in. Where the Lord, Samuel came to all Israel now. Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and encamped beside Ebenezer, and the Philistines uh, encamped at Aphek. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel, and when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines, and they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. It's going to get worse. When the people were coming to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, that it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. They're confusing, like we all do. They're confusing the symbol with the reality. The Ark of the Covenant doesn't save them. God does. The missing link is God, not the Ark. And we all run that risk. Form rather than substance. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring... From there, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, who dwelleth between the cherubim. See there again, the Lord of Hosts is identified as he who dwelleth between the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were, uh, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. And when the Ark of the Covenant uh, of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with the great shouts so of the earth rang again. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? They understood, and they understood that the Ark of the Lord was coming to the camp. Maybe by the shout, and they also probably had spies, but they knew that some, suddenly there was a, an encouragement of some kind in the camp of Israel. And the Philistines were afraid. They said, God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe unto us, for there hath not been such a thing as heretofore. Woe unto us, who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. See, the word had gotten around. Be strong and acquit yourselves like men, O ye Philistines, that ye be not servants unto the Hebrews as they had been to you. Acquit yourselves like men and fight. The Philistines fought. And Israel was smitten. And they fled every man unto his own tent. And there was a very great slaughter, for there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. That's a big loss in anybody's army, let alone the field forces, whatever they were that they had. The ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. There was a man of Benjamin out of the army that came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes torn and the earth upon his head. And when he came, lo, Eli. Now remember, Eli was very venerated. Old man, very venerated in Israel. He was the grand old man, you know, before Samuel. Went. He sat upon a seat by the wayside watching, and his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came to the city and told it, all the city cried out. When Eli heard of the noise of the crying, he said, What meaneth the noise of this tumult? The man came hastily and told Eli. Now Eli was ninety-eight years old, and his eyes were dim that he could not see. The man said to him, Eli, I am he who came out of the army, and I fled today out of the army. He said, What is there done, my son? The messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines. There hath been also a great slaughter among the people, and the two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God is taken. Now, that's got to be a blow to the old man. His sons are dead. But it's interesting to notice what's the biggest blow of all. Verse 18, when it came to pass, when he made mention of the ark of God that he, that Eli, fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck broke, and he died, for he was an old man and heavy. And he had judged Israel forty years. See, the concept that the ark was captured to the rabbinical mind was unthinkable. Yes, he lost his sons. That's got to be a blow. But the ark taken was more than he could handle. His daughter-in-law... 
Phineas' wife was with child near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of the God was taken, that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and prevailed, and her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the woman who stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. She named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel. The word Ichabod apparently means the departed glory. I don't think it's too popular a name these days for children. The ark of God was taken, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. She said, the glory has departed from Israel, the ark of God is taken. So, okay, the Philistines have the ark. <laughs> Tell me God does not have a sense of humor. Let's see what happens. The Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. And when the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And we all know about Dagon, the fish god, the primary god. That was the one that was the idol that ended up collapsing when Samson did his thing, if you recall. When they of Ashdod arose early on the next day, behold, Dagon was fallen on his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. They took Dagon and set him in his place again. When they rose early on the next morning, behold, Dagon was fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon, and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. <laughs> Some pranksters must have been afoot. Huh? <laughs> anyway, therefore, neither the priests of Dagon... And by the way, it gets worse. This gets, just hang on here. This is fun. That's the reason I want to go through this. It's, it's, it's too, if, I, if I paraphrase it, you'd never believe me. You have to see it from this text. Verse 6, uh, But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon Ashdod, and he destroyed them, and he smote them with tumors. Now, that's a polite thing. I think your King James says hemorrhoids, right? Now, if you don't... And this become Even though they're, they're, sometimes your modern translations may try to soften this, they can't hide it. It's going to become clear as we go even Ashdod and, and its borders. And when the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, The ark of the God of Israel shall not abide with us, for his hand is heavy upon us and upon Dagon our God. Now you understand, the Philistines had five cities. We're talking about Ashdod. They figured out their problems are ascribed to this ark. So let's get it out of our town. Let's ship it over to those guys. They sent, therefore, and gathered all the lords of the Philistines, and said to them, What shall we do with the ark of God? They answered, Let the ark of God of Israel be carried about unto Gath, and, Israel, and so forth. And it was so that, after they carried it about, that the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he smote the men of the city, both small and great, that they had hemorrhoids in their secret parts. <laughs> There's no way to make a euphemism here. You got the picture. We're just getting, incidentally, what's also not clear here, but implied by a subsequent verse, that wasn't the only thing. They also apparently had a plague of rats. We'll come to that in a minute. Verse 10. Therefore, they sent the ark of God to Ekron. See, Gath doesn't want it either. They've had, they're all out of preparation H. They've got to ship it over to Ekron. <laughs> it came to pass that the ark of God came to Ekron, that the Ekronites cried out, saying... They have brought about the ark of the God of Israel to us to slay us and our people. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of God of Israel. Let it go again to its own place, that it slay us not and our people. And there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God was very heavy there. And the men that died not were smitten with hemorrhoids. And the cry of the city went up to heaven. Now, what it's, not, it's, it's just glossing over is that there was death, and there were other plagues beside this, but this is so colorful, and also, it, <laughs> you'll see in a minute why this is mentioned. Chapter 6, verse 1, the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines about seven months. They're slow learners. <laughs> the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, saying, what shall we do to the ark of the Lord? Tell us in what way we shall send it to its place. They've come to the conclusion they've got to get rid of it, but there's got to be a proper procedure. Let's ask the priests, their priests. And they said, if we, if ye send away the ark of the God of Israel, send it not empty, but by all means return him a trespass offering. 
Then ye shall be healed, and it shall be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. In other words, by putting an offering with it, number one, you'll be healed, and when you are healed, it'll also confirm that the reason you're in trouble is because of the ark. Interesting logic, okay? Now, by the way, something that's not obvious here, it'll come clear before we're through, in addition to the discomfort that we're kidding about, there were 50,000 that died. So this was, you know, a very intense council meeting they had here. Then said they, well, what shall be the trespass offering when he, that we shall return to him? And they answered, five golden hemorrhoids. <laughs> and five golden mice. See, it's from the mice that we assume that the other plagues were somehow tied to mice or rats. Do you follow me? Because they decide to acknowledge that, both the hemorrhoids and the mice, by making gold ones and offering that as, an, as a trespass offering. And I can't help but try to visualize the fabrication procedure, you know. <laughs> that would be an interesting archaeological find to discover. <laughs> now every time you hear Christmas, you hear five golden rings. You'll remember First Samuel... <laughs> Oh, boy. <laughs> see, it's five because of the number of the lords. There's, see, there's a lord for five. So there's five key cities. That's where there's five. According to the number of the lords of the Philistines, one plague was upon you all and all your lords. Wherefore, you shall make your images of your hemorrhoids and images of your mice that mar the land, and you shall give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will lighten his hand from you and from your God's uh, and from your land. Why then do ye harden your hearts as the Egyptians and the Pharaoh hardened their hearts? Interesting that they know the story, you see. When he had wrought wonderfully among them, did they not let the people go and they depart? Now therefore, make a new cart. And here's an interesting procedure. Think this through. Take two milk cows on which there hath come no yoke and tie the cows to the cart and bring their calves home from them. You talk about a handicap. They're taking cows that are not used to drawing a cart, never have before, that have calves, and they take the calves from them, which is stress on the cow. Probably they're going to obviously, you would think, search for their calves, right? Notice the, the priests are setting up, in effect, what you might call a handicap to make a point. And take the ark of the Lord and lay it upon the cart and put the jewels of gold which you return him for a trespass offering in a box by the side of it. Notice, they're smart enough then to put it inside. Why? Because 50,000 died when they peeked inside earlier. So they don't lift the lid. They've, they figured out that ain't the smooth procedure. <laughs> so they put the offering in a box beside the ark on the cart. And send it away that it may go. And, and see, if it goeth by the way of its own border to Beth Shemesh, then he hath done us this great evil. I mean, God has caused all this, see? But if not, then we shall know that it was not his hand that smote us, but it was a chance that happened to us. To get the logic. So they have these cows that are not used to going, and they're distracted by not having their calves, but if they nevertheless go right where they're supposed to go, then we know it indeed, this is the hand of God. And it was the hand of God that caused all these maladies upon us. If it doesn't, then we know it was something else, some kind of other thing. Verse 10, so the men did so and took two milk cows, tied them to the cart, shut up their calves at home. They laid on the ark upon the cart and the box with the mice of gold and the images of their hemorrhoids. <laughs> and the cows took the straight way to the way of Beth Shemesh and went along the highway, lowing as they went, and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them to the border of Beth Shemesh. And they of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. They lifted up their eyes. And saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. And the ark came to the field of Joshua, the Bethshemite, and stood there. And there was a great stone, and they split the wood of the ark and offered the cows for a burnt offering unto the Lord. This concludes side one. Please turn your tape to side two. And put them on the great stone. And the men of Bethshemesh offered birth, uh, burnt offerings and sacrificed 
sacrifices the same day unto the Lord. And when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. And these are the golden hemorrhoids which the Philistines returned for a trespass offering unto the Lord. For Ashdod won, the Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the box that was in it, wherein were the jewels of gold were, and put them on the great stone. And the men of Beth Shemesh offered birth, uh, burnt offerings and sacrificed sacrifices the same day unto the Lord. And when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. And these are the golden hemorrhoids which the Philistines returned for a trespass offering unto the Lord, for Ashdod one, for Gaza one, for Ashkelon one, for Gath one, and for Ekron one. And the golden mice, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines belonging to the five lords, both of the fortified cities and of the country villages, even unto the great stone of Abel, whereupon they set down the ark of the Lord, in which the Stone remains to this day in the field of Joshua the Bethshemite. And they smote the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. Even he smote of the people 50,000 and threescore and ten men. And the people lamented because the Lord had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. And the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? And to whom shall he go up from us? And they sent messengers to the inhabitants of kiriath Jerim, saying, The Philistines have brought... Again, the ark of the Lord, come ye down and fetch it up to you, and so on. Interesting, interesting episode. And, of course, it's episodes like that that start to, to, you know, shroud the ark with legends of all kinds. It's in Kiriath-Jerim for about 20 years uh, in the house of Abinadab. The ark is neglected during the reign of Saul. And, of course, in about roughly about 1,000 B.C., David brings it, when David takes over, he brings it to Jerusalem. We talked about the story of Uzzah being killed. That's in 2 Samuel 6. It's then in the home of Obed-Edom for about three months, then brought up with much proper fanfare and so forth. It is, of course, put in Solomon's temple in the Holy of Holies, 2 Chronicles 5. It is temporarily removed from Solomon's temple during the reign of Manasseh. Manasseh is one of the worst kings in Israel's history. Manasseh is the one that's credited by non-biblical sources to the guy that uh, sawed Isaiah in half with a wooden saw. He was bad news. Talked about Second Chronicles 33, roughly, and so on. He incidentally repents and is forgiven, and he's, and he's used often by an evangelist to point out that if it, God can forgive Manasseh for all his misdeeds. It helps put ourselves in perspective. Huh? After Manasseh comes Josiah. Jo- Josiah is one of the good guys. And um, he restores proper worship in the land. And there's a very important verse in Second Chronicles 35.3 where Josiah instructs the priest to put the Ark of the Covenant back in the Holy of Holies. Now one reason I emphasize that is because of a uh, uh, an event that apparently occurred in roughly 1 Kings 10. The Queen of Sheba visits Solomon. What's not obvious from the text is she apparently stayed there several years and had a child by Solomon, who is known as Menelik, and among the Ethiopians, Menelik I. He apparently is raised by the priests until he's about 19, whereupon he goes back to Ethiopia and he apparently takes a replica of the Ark of the Covenant with him. And that's a very famous item because in Ethiopia there are a group of uh, that call themselves Falashas that adhere to the ancient traditions of Judaism. In fact, um, you can find all this in the Encyclopedia Britannica or any good secular source. Just look up Ethiopia and specifically the Falashas and you'll find... References to Menelik I, Haile Selassie had as his, one of his titles, one of his many titles, the Lion of the Tribe of Judah. These people uh, ascribe their origin back to Menelik I, an offspring of Solomon himself. They have a underground temple near Lake Uxum in which this replica has been preserved. There, are, there is a, a, um, a, uh, a priesthood. As the children are born in this priesthood, they are trained and they serve their entire life down in that temple guarding this replica. Now, 
the, uh, 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 and it's interesting that Lloyd's of London in 1936 was approached to insure it. There are those that believe that Mussolini's famous invasion of Ethiopia had as one of its objectives the gaining of that ark. There are stories that the Queen of England has visited and seen that ark. Now, there are some that have suggested the idea that because the priesthood was disillusioned with Solomon, who had gone apostate by then, that they assisted in a subterfuge, that they took the actual ark and the replica and switched them. And what Menelik I took back to Ethiopia was the original ark. And the ark that's in Ethiopia today would be that ark. In fact, I also understand that uh, there are those that believe or feel they have evidence of the fact that that ark has been transferred to Israel at a cost of about $3 million. Now, with all apologies to Grant Jeffries and others who sell this pretty hard, I do have a problem viewing that ark as anything but a replica because of Second Chronicles 35.3. Joshua, excuse me, Josiah the king, long after Solomon, had the ark put in the Holy of Holies. If it is a replica, the writer to the Chronicles didn't know that. And my perception of the theories of inspiration have a problem with that. So I personally do not believe that the Ark in Ethiopia, if it does exist, is anything but a replica. Now, if it is a replica, it is priceless. Don't misunderstand me. And it wouldn't surprise me if a replica shows up in the Third Temple. I can't imagine the real Ark showing up simply because I have a, a clear perception of what the destiny of that temple is. It's to be desecrated by the Antichrist. And if you were God, would you want your temple, or would you want your Ark in that temple? I don't think so. A replica, maybe. Anyway, this idea of the Ethiopian Ark is not, to the best of my research, has not been taken seriously by anybody in Israel, even though it's a popular theme among a number of writers and what have you. You all know the story. It was in Solomon's temple until Nebuchadnezzar. In about 606 B.C., in his first siege, he plunders the temple, takes trophies back to Babylon. The Ark is not mentioned in that list. There are those like Maimonides and others, that report that Solomon had anticipated all of this by putting secret passages and secret chambers under the Temple Mount to hide the treasures. And uh, so when the Babylonians plundered the Temple, there's no evidence, biblically or otherwise, that they got the Ark of the Covenant. And, of course, in the third siege of Nebuchadnezzar, they not only plundered it, they destroyed the Temple. So Solomon's Temple is history. And Ezekiel chapter 10 describes the Shekinah leaving, reluctantly, but leaving Solomon's temple uh, in anticipation of all of this. Now, what everybody overlooks is that when Cyrus the Persian conquers the Babylonians, he not only frees the Hebrews to go home, he gives them financial incentives to go home, and he sends all these artifacts back with them. So apparently those things that Nebuchadnezzar captured, he had a museum just north, of, just north of his palace, if you visit there, just north of his palace, there's the museum of Nebuchadnezzar. And that was the place that he had all these artifacts that he plundered. And it's 70 years late, almost 70 years later when Belshazzar is throwing the big party in the palace that he sends next door to get the vessels to use in the party. And that's what causes the handwriting on the wall and so forth. You know the story. All in Daniel 5, you can read it. It's pretty vivid and colorful. But the point is, those artifacts are the things that Cyrus sends back to Jerusalem. Now, there are those that um, point to some other things. It may have been carried away by the Babylonians, but if so, I think the Persians would have returned it. There's also those that believe it was carried away by the Egyptians. Pharaoh Shishak invaded, 1 Kings 14, this is about 926 B.C., though. This is long before. Um, and incidentally, it's Shishak's invasion and the idea that these things were carried to his place called Tanis. That particular, of the many, many different theories about the Ark, that's one of them, and that's the one that provided the foundation for the plot, the movie. The whole business of Tanis and all that wasn't totally contrived. It was sort of derivative from the Shishak uh, ideas. The trouble with that is in Second Chronicles 13, the menorah is still being used. That's 50 pounds worth of gold. It's the fact that it shows up 
in Second Chronicles 13 implies that it was hidden. Certainly Shishak didn't get it. And that seems to substantiate this notion that the really important treasures were successfully hidden away. But the main point is in Second Chronicles 35.3, uh, the uh, ark is still being used. And that's 620 B.C. That's 300 years after Shishak's invasion. So Shishak didn't get the ark because it's being used by Josiah. Do you follow me? Okay. Now, you also, if you've been following all the different ark legends, you know that there's all kinds of characters traipsing through Jordan looking for the Ark of the Covenant. Why are they looking in Jordan of all places? Well, because there's a passage in 2 Maccabees chapter 2, the first eight verses. Now, 1 Maccabees is a book that has, it's not inspired, but has some historical interest. 2 Maccabees is full of all kinds of fanciful things. So most biblical scholars of, uh, that take the Bible seriously don't regard 2 Maccabees as being anything but some fanciful writings. But nevertheless, in 2 Maccabees chapter 2, first eight verses, reads as follows. The records show that it was the prophet Jeremiah who ordered the exiles to hide the fire, as has been mentioned, also that having given them the law, he charged them not to neglect the ordinance of the Lord or to be led astray by the sight of gold and silver with all their finery. In similar words, he appealed to them not to abandon the law. Furthermore, this document records that prompted by a divine message, the prophet gave orders that the tent of meeting and the ark should go with him. Then he went away to the mountain from the top of which Moses saw God's promised land. When he reached the mountain, Jeremiah found a cave dwelling. He carried the tent, that is the tabernacle, the ark and the incense altar into it and then blocked up the entrance. Some of his companions came to mark out the way, but they were unable to find it. When Jeremiah learnt of this, he reprimanded them, saying, The place shall remain unknown, he said, until God finally gathers his people together and shows mercy to them. Then the Lord will bring these things to light again, and the glory of the Lord will appear with the cloud, as it has been seen both in the time of Moses and when Solomon prayed at, that the shrine might be worthily consecrated. Now, we do know that Jeremiah was taken to Taphanes in Egypt, uh, after the fall of Jerusalem, by a remnant of the Jews. That's in Jeremiah 42, most of the chapter. Mount Nebo is about 35 miles southwest of Amman, in Jordan. And because of this passage in Maccabees, some people take it seriously, and they, they, they try to figure out which is Mount Nebo, and they start looking for caves. And uh, Wendell Jones, I think, has been tracking that stuff down, and also thinks the ashes of the red heifer is there and all of that. And uh, there are passages in the mission that indicate that's not where it is. I believe uh, there's two things you should know if you're going to get into this. The Tese- there are a number of major sources. The Tanakh, the Old Testament, the Mishnah, and also the Tesefta. These are ancient, highly venerated rabbinical writings. The Tesefta makes it clear that neither the Ark of the Covenant nor the ashes of the red heifer are essential to the temple. And everybody seems to overlook that. Dr. Kaufman is the guy that pointed that out to me. Uh, it's, so these things are interesting, but peripheral. The Ark of the Covenant was not in Herod's temple. And uh, for a lot of reasons. First of all, there was one greater than the temple was here. Who is that? Jesus Christ, you betcha. A guy by the name of Kratzer uh, some time ago uh, made an announcement and took 200 pictures of a find he found in a cave at Mount Nebo. From the pictures, it's clear it's not the Ark of the Covenant. It's the wrong size, and it doesn't fit the situation. It's wrong dimensions. And also the Jordanian government's upset because it was an illegal dig, and so he's a persona non grata there, and there's a lot of ruhas. There was another story that kind of intrigued me. I don't think it's true either, but it's kind of a fun story. Ron Wyatt uh, claims that the Ark is in a ca- was found in a cavern under Golgotha. There were fissures in the Golgotha, and that the Ark was hidden in a chamber underneath Golgotha. Well, this is a colorful story, because if that's true, then Christ, when he shed his blood that flowed through the fissures, would have sprinkled the mercy seat. That's kind of, you know, if you have any Levitical sensitivity, that's kind of interesting. But it really overlooks the fact that his blood was presented at a tabernacle not made with hands, as he, as, as is well explained. So it's a colorful thing, and also it's interesting that the, all the falderall seems to have evaporated. Um, now, this gets to really the key idea. Maimonides, 
a very highly venerated Hebrew sage that wrote in the 1100s, Moses Menbonides, indicated that Solomon had a network of tunnels beneath the Temple Mount in anticipation of its possible destruction, had a secret chamber that was later used by King Josiah, which included a cruise of oil, a flask of manna, and the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was not in Herod's temple. But some of the rabbis explained the reason it wasn't. It was known where it was. It was not put in Herod's temple because Herod's temple was never finished. And that's true. It was The work ceased in 63 A.D. and it was still unfinished. Of course, the Romans destroyed it in 70 A.D. And to support this view, the rabbis point out that they know that the golden altar, the altar of incense, was hidden with the Ark of the Covenant. And the golden altar was in Herod's temple. Now, whenever I encountered, when I encountered that, it blew me away because I had heard a very colorful legend that I did not take seriously until then. And the legend has to do with the mantle of Elijah. If you recall the whole the colorful ministry of Elijah the prophet, that uh, he did some pretty wild things. I don't know how Cecil B. DeMille missed him. He was he provided a lot of interesting music uh, uh, movie scripts, in effect, Carmel and all that. But when Elijah gets translated, it's time for the Lord to take him up, and he doesn't die, he gets caught away. It's his protege, this guy by the name of Elisha, that's following him around the landscape. And this uh, Elisha, whatever else is true, is one of his major spiritual gifts is chutzpah. Because he not only has the audacity to want to be Elijah's uh, follow-on, he wants a double portion. I'm always intrigued by that because I, I can't imagine following Eli- in Elijah's footsteps. But furthermore, to follow in his footsteps and say, I want twice as much is kind of interesting. And of course, uh, it ends up that he does get Elijah's mantle. It also is interesting when you study uh, the book of Second Kings, you discover that Elijah did eight miracles when you add them up. And Elisha does 16. And I think that's kind of interesting. But the question is, what happens when Elisha finally dies? And apparently the rabbinical writings indicate that he, no one was considered worthy. So they took his leather belt and his mantle and stored it in the golden altar of the tabernacle or the temple. Golden altar is about three foot high and it's primarily for incense altar, just outside the Holy of Holies. But apparently inside they store Elisha's or Elijah's mantle after Elijah dies. Now, the legend that I came across was that Zechariah of New Testament, the one that's going to be the father of John the Baptist, was uh, ministering in his, in his cycle of, priest, uh, of ministry in the holy place when Gabriel appears to him and announces the birth of the one that will be John the Baptist. What's not in the Bible, but the subject of his legend, is that Zechariah was also told to take the mantle of Elijah out of the golden altar and go home. And 30 years later, when John the Baptist is ministering, the legend is that he was wearing the actual mantle and leather girdle of Elijah. And if that's true, see, it's colorful because it puts a little different color on the idea that Jesus says he came in the power, John came in the power, spirit and power of Elijah. It also would explain how Here's Elijah in the Jordan, uh, preaching at the Jordan, at Beth Barah, the very place that Joshua originally brought Israel through the Red Sea, uh, through the uh, Jordan, excuse me. That's 20 miles away from Jerusalem, and the way they traveled in those days was on foot. And there are so many people traveling from Jerusalem to the Jericho area to hear John the Baptist preach that it was a, an attendance problem. The scribes sent a inquiry team to find out what's going on. Why would people travel on foot 20 miles to hear a preacher in the wilderness? Certainly not because of the popularity of his message, repent, you know. Um, and the theory is, or the suggestion is, is that if he was, the word got around, he was wearing the mantle of Elijah. Something big was going on. So that was the draw, presumably. Now, all of this was colorful, but of no real consequence, until I discovered there is a rabbinical evidence, apparently, that the golden altar was in Herod's temple. That's kind of interesting. 
But now, the real issue then is, um, where is the ark today? There are those that believe the ark will never be found. And the reason they hang their hat on Jeremiah 3.16, which mentions, we can take a quick look at it, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 16. And this is the passage that people use that want to argue that the ark is forever lost. come to pass when ye are multiplied and increased in the land. In those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they miss it, neither shall that be done anymore. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and so on. Now those that believe the ark will never be found, hang their head on this verse. Those that want to still look for the ark say, well, this is really in the millennium. So it still isn't, it isn't as tight as you'd like. As I mentioned, there are people that think the ark's in Ethiopia or was. I don't take, I personally don't take that serious. Doesn't mean I'm right. I can be wrong as can be, but I personally don't take that too seriously. There are people that think the ark's hidden in Jordan. I don't take that too seriously. If the ark is around and hidden, the abundance of experts believe it's under the Temple Mount to, to this very day. There are rabbinical writings that imply that it was hidden in a chamber under what's called the chamber of wood in Herod's temple. So once they locate, and there's there's research going on to do that, the precise location of Herod's temple, then the the first place they'll look is under the place that was a chamber of wood to see if they can find a chamber that's hiding the Ark of the Covenant, because that's one very strong rabbinical tradition. Now, where did the temple stand? We've talked about that. There's a lot of the traditional site is, of course, at the Dome of the Rock. Dr. Kaufman has a number of reasons why he believes it stood to the north. But there's an increasing amount of evidence that's starting to intrigue me substantially that it was to the south. And we've talked about that, and that's a whole other study. But the point is, as they pin that down, then uh, the Ark of the Covenant possibly may be found. If you want the most authoritative view on this, the two people that you would probably consider the most competent, most informed authorities about the Ark of the Covenant would be Rabbi Shlomo Goran, who is the chief rabbi of the state of Israel. Also, Rabbi Yehuda Getz, who is also very senior, and it's his, he is in charge of what's called the rabbinical tunnel, this interesting tunnel that has been, that goes along the uh, uh, the wall, all the way from the uh, Western Wall, Wailing Wall, as we call it, to uh, the Antonia Fortress. Both of these men have gone on record that they know where the Ark is and that it's under the Temple Mount. They've said this very, not conjecturally or as a suggestion or as a belief, very in very positive terms. The Temple Institute that's making these six, has made these 60 uh, of the 93 required implements have made almost all the major things they need with the exception of the menorah. They've made the castings for that. If you visit Israel, you can see a mock-up of one. It's very large. It's, you know, tall. And the lamp stands are about the size of a grapefruit. It's a big thing. It's, they have the castings, but they have to, uh, they got to make it out of gold. That runs about $7 million. So they haven't built that one yet. But the point is, They have no plans to build the Ark of the Covenant. Why? Rabbi Richman, why? Because we know where it is. And again, it's not a conjecture or possibility. They say this with great positivism. So it's clear that the most knowledgeable experts in Israel believe it is at this very time hidden under the mount somewhere. And if so, it's going to uh, get pretty interesting pretty quick because there's a lot of research going on. And as the whole temple story unfolds, uh, we'll watch for that. Now, for you and I, the issue isn't the Ark of the Covenant anyway, colorful though it is. And the issue isn't the... Incidentally, the issue isn't the Ark anyway, it's the temple. The prophetic event. The Ark of the Covenant has no role, to my awareness, in Bible prophecy as we understand it. In fact, if anything, the destiny of the temple that is being rebuilt would suggest the Ark won't be there. 
because the Holy of Holies of that temple after consecrate, being consecrated is going to be the subject of betrayal of Israel by this coming world leader. The whole idea of the temple being rebuilt is exciting because it shows us what time it is. If you want to know what time it is in God's calendar, you always look at Israel. Israel is regathered in the land exactly as the Bible said. Israel has regained biblical Jerusalem exactly as the Bible said. And the next major milestone on God's calendar, on Israel's, on that scenario we call Israel, (laughs) is the building of the temple. And they've begun. They're moving day by day down that path. They have scientists searching for the right marine snails to yield exactly the right Levitical blue and royal purple for the vestments that are being woven as we speak on computerized looms for the priests. They fabricated his headdress and all these other, as I say, about 60 of the 93 required. 200 priests are in training. They're going to need a lot more, but that's the beginning. They are getting ready. So it's all happening. And I think that's exciting. Not because we have any equity in the temple. That temple has a very bizarre destiny. But because it tells us that the time is near. And we've been talking in these several... We're going to get back into a study of expositional study of a book, which has been my style, but we've taken an interlude here for some weeks just hitting some special messages. And we've talked about these various scenarios. There isn't any one little pet theory... Every major theme of prophecy is unfolding before our very eyes. Ezekiel tells us there's, in effect, going to be a Muslim invasion led by, armed and led by Russia into, against Israel. And they're ready. And they're going to do it with nuclear weapons. And they have, the, the, the protagonists have them in hand and they're perishable assets, which means they either use them or lose them. While all this is going on, the Bible says there's going to be a super state emerging in Europe. There's going to be a world, uh, uh, world government. And as we talk, the race is on to see who's going to try to organize this world government. Bush is trying to do it through the UN. The Europeans have another idea. The Pope has yet another idea. Daniel 2 and 7 tell, tells us how that's going to all come out. It's happening, it's happening while we speak. Bible says that Babylon's going to be rebuilt on the banks of the Euphrates. And Saddam Hussein has spent 20 years preparing the fulfillment of that prophecy. Every major theme of prophecy. Now, what's really interesting to me is that every one of those major themes of prophecy deals with events that occur during a very specific seven-year period of time on the planet Earth, known among scholars as the 70th week of years of the prophet Daniel, alluding to Daniel 9, where Gabriel gives him a seven, 70 periods of seven weeks each, seven years each. Um, And the last one is the only one left unfulfilled. The last one is about to transpire. But that's a prophecy for Israel. Jesus in Luke 19 says that Israel set aside for a time. And Paul tells us for how long until the church is complete. When the church is complete, God will again deal with the world through Israel. Jesus comes back twice, once for his church and once for Israel. Well, if the 70th week of Daniel is on the horizon... We know it's defined by a treaty by this coming world leader. He enforces a treaty for seven years. That defines that very thing from Daniel 9.27. He can't enforce a treaty until he's in power. He can't be in power until after he appears publicly. The interval between his appearing publicly and uh, being in power could be a day or it could be 30 years. We don't know. But the main point, Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians 2, that he can't even appear until we're out of here. That's strange stuff. That implies the rapture is on the horizon. Very close. As I'm fond of pointing out, if you're driving down the street and you notice the store is decorating for Christmas, you know that Thanksgiving is not far away. Now, does that mean we should just pause and stop and everything we're doing? Heavens no. The rapture could be as close as 30 years away. Hmm. Huh. I tell it to audiences and I see them look crestfallen. In the 1970s, we all made mistakes. We got so excited about the obviousness that God was moving that we thought, gee, the rapture's around the corner and a lot of kids didn't go to college and people didn't raise families and all that stuff. Big mistake. Contrary to what God told you to do. Jesus said, occupy till I come. You plan to go to college? Do it. Plan to raise a family? Great. 
you got some tough stewardship questions with the coming economic turmoil in this particular country. And one of the things we as Christians, as everybody says we call ourselves pre-trib. I'm not pre-trib or post-trib, mid-trib. I'm pre-70th week of Daniel. A little different position. But one of the things we all do is we assume it's going to be peaches and cream between now and the rapture. Wrong. Just because we will not go through the tribulation, and that's clear to anyone that's done their homework. That doesn't mean we won't have tribulation small t. Most of the, an increasing percentage of the body of Christ on the planet Earth meets under conditions of peril. Christians that have been tolerated in the world of Islam are now being persecuted and driven out. A lot of Egyptian Christians are panicked because Islam is starting to get tough, censoring letters, tapping phones, squeezing. It's getting worse. Just because of the thaw in the Soviet Union, and certainly they are open. I'll come back to that in a minute. Nevertheless, all through the world, the body of Christ is suffering. We've had it pretty soft in this country, but it's not going to stay that way. Increasingly, government bureaucracies. Pete Wilson's minions are getting tough on... He's got some of his bureaucrats out of control. Washington has some of its bureaucrats out of control. It's no longer fashionable to be a Christian. As time goes on, it's going to be less and less fashionable. So we need to recognize that it's not going to be as easy going down, downstream. So it's going to be tough times. The economic pressures are going to create tough times. The unemployment, the civil unrest, there's going to be a lot of troubles. and Everybody will be looking for scapegoats. So one of the things we might do, not get, I'm not suggesting we adopt a post-tribulational mentality, but I do think it doesn't hurt us to get our heads up and start be doing some homework about being good stewards on behalf of our families. The tough problem isn't stewardship for yourself. That's the easy one. The tough problem is being a steward for third parties that, for whom you're responsible. So that's a whole other subject. But the point is, the good news is, we are close. I don't know if close is... Three days, three months, or 30 years. I really don't. I think it's a lot closer than that because I look at all kinds of indicators that imply it's re- the fuse is getting short. But I also think it's important for us not to overreact to that and, and uh, screw up our lives from a, from a stewardship point of view. And yet, Jesus clearly wanted us to expect him at any moment. And we have more reasons today than ever before in 2,000 years, to understand prophecy. There are verses that have escaped understanding for 2,000 years that are clear today. Daniel's predicted that would be true, that knowledge would be increased. In in a very direct, textual, spiritual sense, it has been. There are passages today that the the, uh, earlier commentators hadn't a clue that are now very, very clear. And we're beginning to understand prophecy much more vividly, much more clearly than ever before. And uh, the little discovery from Amos 7.1 we talked about last time is an example. Not that it's that profound, but it highlights the fact that our clarity of understanding of biblical doctrines today are, in fact, crisper, sharper, clearer than they were hundreds or thousands of years ago. That's exciting. And, of course, the question I always like to leave you with as we close is what are you going to do about it? It's fun to talk about these things. It's interesting to see the temple being built, and we see every day we learn more about which nuclear weapons are in whose hands, and and we watch all of that with a degree of apprehension, a degree of excitement, both at the same time. We watch every day as you read your daily newspaper, you can find something there that you would not understand unless you had a biblical background. It's happening at an exciting pace. But the question is, what are you going to do about it? Is it impacting your life? Are you starting to really take the Bible seriously? Because as I've told you a thousand times, don't believe anything I've told you. Luke tells you, don't believe anything Chuck Missler tells you. But to search the Scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. Find out for yourself what the Bible says about the temple, Babylon, Europe, Russia, whatever. Do your homework. First of all, it's fun. It's exciting. It's happening. You literally uh, watch the paper every day and say, hey, I just read about that last night. But also, 
be sure of your position in Jesus Christ. Don't gamble your eternity that the Bible is wrong. Jesus Christ provided an eligibility for you for a destiny that's so fantastic there's no way you can even understand it, let alone qualify for it on your own. But it's available for the asking. But it is a transaction. You have to ask for it. There is an entry ticket with your name on it. But you have to accept it. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. And let's bow our hearts. Father, we just thank you that we have a personal relationship with one who is our Ark of the Covenant. One who fulfilled all of this on our behalf. One to whom all these things pointed as a figure. We thank you, Father, for the person of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that through the Holy Spirit you have chosen to reveal him to us. We thank you, Father, for your word and that it became incarnate and dwell among us in his person. We thank you, Father, that you've brought us to this moment in time that we might behold his glory, that we might understand maybe just a little bit more as to what you have done on our behalf. We would ask you, Father, that you would increase in us a hunger for your word, that you would increase in us through your Holy Spirit, an increased awareness of what you would have of us in these days, that unique ministry you have for each and every one of us. Help us, Father, to move into those portions of scriptures that you would draw each of us individually, uniquely, into, that we can discover very specifically what you would have of us in return, that we might be more responsive to your will in our lives, that we might bear fruit for your kingdom. that we might be more pleasing in thy sight. And Father, as you go forth tonight, we pray that you would be with each of us, for you, own, you alone know the needs here assembled. You know the needs for healing, the needs for employment and sustenance. Heal our families, heal our relationships, and above all, Father, draw us closer to you. And Father, as we go forward through our trials, we know, Father, that they're all filtered by you, that there's nothing that can come into our lives but that which you have ordained. But, Father, we would pray that the lessons not be wasted. Help us understand what you are doing in each of our lives, that there also we may be more responsive to your will and instruction. We commit all these things before you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.